theory claims that we all have these eight intelligences and uh, people differ from one another in their profile of intelligences and there's no necessary link between one intelligence and the other. It also is based on the assumption that we wouldn't have these intelligences if they hadn't been valuable in human evolution. Um, an example I like to use is that the we developed a naturalist intelligence so we knew what to eat and what not to eat and uh, to be able to pay attention to which animals to run away from and which animals to hunt uh, and of course which plants to eat and which ones. So that, I mean, there's a reason why we're sensitive to the world of nature. Now most of us, uh, particularly people who would watch this, are, they go to supermarkets and they don't have to um, know anything about the, the wild. But I think that the, the neural networks which evolved to help us get around in the savannas of East Africa 50,000 years ago, they're now being used for a consumer society and we decide which shoes to buy and which car to buy and we're looking at the same kinds of things that our ancestors did but we're doing it in terms of uh, walking through the mall rather than, rather than walking through uh, the, or running through the, the savanna and hoping we won't get you know, eaten by, by, by some, kind of a, some kind of a creature. Um, the as history unfolds, as cultures evolve, of course the intelligences which they value change. I would say until a hundred years ago, if you wanted to have higher education, linguistic intelligence what was, import was important. I teach at Harvard and 125 years ago, 150 years ago, the entrance exams were Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Um, and if, for example, you, had, you were dyslexic, that would be very difficult because it would be hard for you to learn those languages, which are basically written languages. People don't uh, speak Greek when they, when they, learn, they learn ancient Greek. Um, then over the last century, clearly the logical mathematical intelligence is something we pay a lot of attention to, and the uh, linguistic intelligence is a little bit more of, a, of an option. Um, but once one looks at the world of occupations, uh, you know, we have hundreds of occupations, and uh, I think the reason that Dan Goldman's work on social and emotional intelligence has got so much attention is because while your, your IQ, which is sort of language logic, will get you behind the desk, if you don't know how to deal with people, if you don't know how to re read yourself, you know, you're, you're going to end up just staying at that desk forever or eventually being asked to make room for somebody who does have social or emotional intelligence. And when the singularity occurs and the machines are smarter than we are, then it's the artistic kinds of intelligence uh, or intelligence used artist artistically to be more precise, which will come to the fore. Well, I think you can talk about reformism in two senses. One is it's clear that when I developed this theory in, in the late 1970s, I was trying to reform the way psychologists and other people think about intelligence. So certainly I had an iconoclastic or reformist inclination there. And I was kind of surprised, one, that the psychologists didn't all line up in a row and say, you're right, we've been wrong for a hundred years. Um, that's somewhat facetious. But I was surprised at how much interest there was within the educational world. And there, I would say, gradually, um, I switched from simply saying, this is how I think the mind is organized and how it has developed, to I think maybe there are things we should do things differently in education because of the theory. And then really in the last 15 years, I think I've become much more reformist because I've been concerned about the ethical dimensions of our society. That doesn't grow in any natural way out of multiple intelligences theory. Um, if, we, if I look at it somewhat autobiographically, as a young person I was very much involved with music. Uh, I was a serious pianist and while I never thought about a career in music, music was and has been very important to me. And then when I got to college, I became interested in the other art forms, and then I spent a year in, in England as a fellow, and I really immersed myself in drama, that's great to do in theater, in, in London, and, and art galleries, and sort of expanded my artistic uh, horizons. And then when I be went to graduate school in psychology, I was stunned at how the arts were never mentioned. To be a developed person cognitively meant to be a scientist and to think scientifically. And we could speculate about why that's so. But the first serious book I wrote was called The Arts and Human Development. And what I said in that book, this is in the early 70s, is all developmental psychology has thought of science as the apotheosis of human development. 
Yet science is a modern Western invention, and you know, we might well never have invented science and if you had no Galileo and Copernicus and Newton. On the other hand, arts exist in just about every society, and they're very important. So can we conceptualize development in terms of the arts as well as the, as the sciences? Nowadays, nobody takes extreme positions on that issue. Uh, maybe someday the press will learn not to take extreme positions on the issue. Um, and uh, I certainly believe that every intelligence has a genetic component. Um, how else would it exist? And every intelligence has a certain heritability. That's the technical term for how much of the variation in the population has to do with who your, I always say, with who your biological grandparents were, because uh, that's a better set of genes than your parents, because you've got four sets rather than, than two. We don't know what the heritability is of most intelligences, but from a lot of research we know that um, on the average um, human traits are about 0.5 heritable. So, you know, uh, that means that, uh, you know, genes make a big contribution, but so do parents, culture, the media, peers, and so on. Um, I guess I've never put it this way before, but maybe what I would say is, you know, the intelligences that you favor are probably ones where you have a genetic predisposition. But how you use those intelligences is going to be overwhelmingly determined by the culture in which you're born and your parents and what they value and whether you get along with your parents and that kind of thing. So the deployment of intelligences is probably largely a nurture factor. But, you know, if, say, you know, Bach, the Bach family had a lot of genes going for it in the music area and probably, you know, that was pretty, pretty, pretty likely that they were going to end up being musicians even if they hadn't if, even if they'd been, so to speak, separated at birth and they'd been raised in another kind of family. And the first thing I would say is that life isn't fair, and some people are going to be strong in a lot of intelligences, and some people aren't. Um, I think of the intelligence as a set of computers. And if you wanted to summarize my theory in a sentence, we used to think there was just one general computer in here, and if you were good at one thing, you'd be good at everything, and if you were lousy, you'd one thing. So kind of smarter across the board, stupid across the board. I think the the step I took, I would call it an advance, is you can be very smart with language, average with music, lousy with understanding other people, or vice versa. There's no necessarily correlation between the two. But I think stupid has two very different connotations. One is that your computer isn't very good. Um, for example, I'm very, not biologically very good spatially, but the truth is with a map and a, and a position uh, you know, a determiner and a, you know, a some uh, special attention to the environment, I can do perfectly, perfectly well. But I suppose if there were a test of spatial intelligence, I wouldn't do very well. So one meaning for stupid is it takes you a long time to do what it takes other people who are smarter in that intelligence. I mean, I'm very musical, especially when I was younger. I heard something once. Not only didn't, could I remember it, I couldn't forget it. And so that's smart in a kind of a, 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 a technical sense. But the other sense of stupid, which I think is much more important, is how do you go about leading your life? Uh, you know, do you know what you're trying to do? Can you achieve it? When you make a mistake, do you make the same mistake again? Or do you uh, um, simply stick in a rut? Um, and you know, that has to do with your own understanding of yourself, what you're trying to achieve, what I call intrapersonal intelligence. And I'd much rather to have somebody who was stupid in the first sense but had a good sense about how to negotiate their way through life than somebody who had the computers going full blast but kept uh, knocking their head against the wall. I make fun of Mensa. I don't know a great deal about Mensa. That's the high IQ group. But I say, you know, to get into Mensa, you have to have a high IQ. And once you get in, you spend your time congratulating people who are in Mensa with you. To me, that's a pretty stupid way to spend your life.